Okay, yeah. good. Well, we are here in uh, the offices of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation on Rampart Street with the executive director of that organization, Don Marshman. It's uh, May 21st, 19... <laughs> it's May 21st, 2014. Uh, I'm j asking the questions uh, are me, Jack Davis, uh, and Justin Nystrom, uh, we'll, we'll ask some later on. Professor Nystrom is, the, uh, is on the uh, faculty at Loyola and uh, in history department. We are conducting this interview as part of a series of uh, discussions of what happened in New Orleans in the 1970s uh, that made that decade so interesting. Um, Don, we, we, uh, we don't need to confine ourselves to the, the actual uh, years of, uh, of the decade, and, uh, but I wanted to find out what were you doing in 1970, but maybe more important, how did you get there and where had you come from to arrive in New Orleans uh, scene in 1970? Well, I arrived in New Orleans at Southern Baptist Hospital in 1950, so that was my beginning right. of the, the New Orleans experience. And uh, it was very fortunate. I think I, I, I look back at those times and sort of uh, feel that I was lucky to be born in 1950. There was the sort of post-World War II happenings that I think changed this country. And um, one of the nice things about growing up um, and I attended St. Martin's Episcopal School from kindergarten through 12th grade, and it was a great, great experience. Um, but my mother was heavily involved in the arts. And she had grown up in New Orleans, and her whole family had been a very dynamic family here in New Orleans. Her sister was the uh, first uh, woman vice president of the Times Picayune. Um, my uncle was the swimming coach at Tulane. My other uncle was the vice president of Sinclair Oil. All of them depression kids that, you know, really excelled in their later lives. And my mother um, basically had started her own business um, in the 30s, uh, Dixie Art Supplies, and uh, sold part of it to a, a national company based out of New York. And uh, so she was running two different businesses here and through Dixie Art Supplies I uh, started the Downtown Gallery and the Downtown Gallery um, first started on uh, Porter Street and then moved to St. Anne Street and that's where I really got to know as a young child um, artists like George Durow and John McCready and Mildred mm -hmm. Wool and everything. What were the, the dates that the gallery opened on um, the it first was, location in the It was second. pretty much the mid-60s uh -huh. and everything, and George Giroux had his first exhibition there, and there was the Orleans Gallery, which was probably the best contemporary art gallery. It was a cooperative that really came out of the Tulane School of Architecture and Department of Art, and there was a need for another gallery, and so um, the downtown gallery was formed, and um, that also brought us to the French Quarter. Uh, and I guess this really was the early 60s, because I remember in roughly about 1962 going every Sunday, we would go to Preservation Hall and listen to music. Then we would go to uh, the coffee pot next door, which was a whole different experience than it is now. We all had our mugs and there was a transvestite waiters and we didn't know what the hell was going on. And then you'd go into the, you know, Jackson Square and there would be the organ grinder with the monkey who, if you gave him a penny, it would throw it back at you. And then we'd go get ice cream at Pierre Antoine's and stuff. So it was a nice cultural experience, although we didn't live in the quarter. Where did you live? I uh, lived um, near the Metairie New Orleans Country Club area, I guess the uh, Metairie Cemetery area and stuff. So uh, right off of Metairie Road in New Orleans, last street in New Orleans Parish. And, uh, uh, you know, had typical kind of upbringing, you know, private school upbringing in New Orleans and everything. Uh, very limited interaction with the African-American community other than it was the African-American woman that raised the family. My mother was an executive at that time, so there was a lot of interaction there and I think helped me understand and gain uh, a comfortable relationship with other people and everything, which I really appreciate. Um, and has really, I thought, think, 
been a great thing for me throughout my career here because New Orleans is an African-American city. And, you know, growing up in the arts and going to art exhibits and uh, family was also involved with the opera and other cultural institutions. Um, when I came back from college in Virginia, um, I worked in the family business and uh, basically the Contemporary Art Center was being formed and I was, you know, tangentially involved. It was mainly a, a program that uh, people like Gene Nathan, Bob Cannon, Lou Buglade, uh, Buddy Frazier and others, uh, Jenny Hardy had really been putting together and uh, they were looking for an executive director and been doing a national search. And When did you get back from college? Um, I came back in roughly 1972 mm -hmm. and that was sort of my first experience with Jazz Fest. You know, I didn't, was unable to attend the, the 70 and 71 Jazz Fest in Beauregard Square, but by 72 it was out at the fairgrounds. And I was involved with the Louisiana Craft Council, and we always had a booth out there sort of showcasing the, the Louisiana contemporary craftspeople. And, you know, it was an exciting time in New Orleans in that early 70s um, with Jazz Fest and everything else that was going on. I, I didn't mean to distract you from sure. the, the, the contemporary art center right, right. formation. But that was a little bit later. Uh, Contemporary Art Center was basically founded in um, 1976, and the, I was hired in, in 1977. Um, the first couple exhibits were sort of co-curated by the, you know, different community members and stuff. The big opening that had, you know, the St. Aug Band and, and Fats Domino's Cadillac and a recreation of the Katz and Bestoff uh, drug counter since it was a Katz and Bestoff drugstore and warehouse on 900 Camp Street. And then I think Don Dido had uh, curated a show, Electronic Visions, which was really looking at new technologies and video and computers and, and even CB radio, CD radio, CB radios, I guess at that yeah. time whenever I was into talking to truck drivers and each other on the road. but. Um, it was an exciting time in New Orleans where I think you had the baby boomers, that whole generation of younger people um, either coming back to New Orleans or moving to New Orleans. There was real energy, I think, in the country that um, really transformed New Orleans at and that, that time. energy was not uh, in existence in New Orleans in the 1960s or in not really. I think you, you know, you still had the very, very traditional old New Orleans um, that, you know, was was tied into, you know, the Mardi Gras ball scene, the debutante parties, the, the sort of the backwards business community that that excluded outsiders. You know, I can remember different times in the, you know, the '70s where uh, business people would try to to do new things. I remember the uh, International City Bank with Eats Pointement coming, you know, and trying to put together a very progressive bank in New Orleans. And even though he was a, a Rex member and I guess eventual king, uh, he was turned away by the business community that was threatened by, you know, this sort of new banking type of situation that was prevalent in Houston and other cities and everything. So New Orleans was a very, very closed society. You know, and people I remember heard, in, uh, well, I wasn't here, but the, uh, in, in the early 1970s, the city was still living with the legacy of the cultural center thinking right. that had uh, planned a you know opera house and a performing arts theater and basically a mini Lincoln Center that was to occupy those blocks that were torn down in Treme. Right. I mean, it was and sad so to what I mean the the initial sadness of what happened to Treme by urban renewal of of you know tearing this this wonderful neighborhood down because I think. Even though New Orleans has, so many people have had such great respect for historic preservation and I guess, you know, some of the legislation that was passed was really, you know, uh, groundbreaking for this country, that we still made a couple mistakes and one of the biggest was tearing down blocks and blocks of historic Treme. Um, but it was interesting, you know, once the, the damage was done, um, sort of the progressive thinking um, of, you know, creating this center, um, and I, I, you know, the Armstrong Park concept that I guess was basically a Tivoli Garden type of thing, and 
It was going to be at the site of the cultural center right. to try to make something of something this vacant land right. that had been cleared right. out by. And, and the thinking across the country of that sort of urban renewal and you tear down neighborhoods and you build new things, you know, it, it only infected New Orleans in certain areas. Luckily, it didn't really happen uptown or in the French Quarter, which, mm -hmm. you know, was prevented. But so to get from the early 60s cultural center right. kind of thinking to the early 70s contemporary arts center thing, what had to happen? We had to have new people in town? It was, it was we a, had to have, what else? Well, I mean, it was a, a growth, I think, across the country. I mean, when you look at um, population and, you know, all of a sudden in the 70s, you were getting young people who were coming out of art schools. I mean, I think that was sort of the first explosion of education's impact, whether it was from architecture schools or art schools or theater schools. You had this wave of young people in the city in, you know, by the mid-70s, there were new faces. I mean, I can remember in the 60s, you could count the numbers of professional artists on your hands. I mean, we've always had a great visual arts community, a lot of it because of the French Quarter and the culture we have here. But um, your next wave of younger artists came in about that time. And all of a sudden, there was, um, it was happening nationally. And you had a feeling um, nationally that with this growth of artists, the artists wanted to take control of their future and the situation. So there was sort of a reaction against traditional museums. And what was being born across the country and actually supported by the National Endowment for the Arts was the artist space movement. And so you had artists in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and Atlanta and New Orleans coming together and saying, you know, we want to come together and create something that supports us and allows for, you know, new expressions in art. And that's how the Contemporary Art Center kind of came together as an alternative to the tradition. Was, um, was the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans different from these other artists' uh, places in other cities at the same time? There, I mean, there were a lot of similarities. Um, but in New Orleans, I think because of this growth of artists, um, and needing a support system and a place to exhibit, um, it became an organization that was really focused on the artist here. And, and I think part of that, you know, I was fortunate enough to be selected as executive director, being from New Orleans and having friends, you know, in the arts. I mean, not only did I know a lot of the artists through the downtown gallery, but having run the family business of Dixie Art Supplies, you know, I was helping artists on a regular basis, and so I, I knew the the graphic design community, the architectural engineering community, and the arts community, and um, these were people I knew and, and cared about. And so I think I kind of guided the Contemporary Arts Center at that point to being this massive support system of, you know, we have four floors here, let's turn everybody loose. On. You were the founding director. I was the founding the director, the first director there, and um, it was a, you know, an interesting experience. Basically, um, you know, there was no money to pay me for the first six months, and uh, you know, it, it was it was an exciting time where um, we opened the doors and basically told artists, you know, you know, what are your ideas, you know, and and we'll make them happen and stuff, and so. Um, I kind of learned through other gallery experiences and other things to sort of, you know, create environments where if you're inclusive, you know, for example, one of the first really great shows at the Contemporary Arts Center was the Louisiana Environments show in 1977, where we invited artists to come into the building, an under-renovated building, and go through the first two floors and pick out a space and create an environment. And, you know, it was amazing. I think we had roughly 40 artists. And it was ranging from, you know, traditional, well-known artists like 
um, Ida Kohlmeyer and Jim Richard, down to artists who had just moved to town. And, and they were doing Louisiana in natural environments? Or well, it was called Louisiana Environments. It was, you know, sort of a, a loose tie, to, uh, a loose, you know, concept where somebody took over the bathrooms. I remember uh, a young artist taking over the bathrooms and copying all the graffiti that they had read in all the bars in New Orleans on the walls. Um, uh, others um, had just taken spaces. Uh, you know, an artist, uh, Kitty O'Mealy, had taken one of the rooms and she was painting uh, trees looking up from the ground through the trees at the time, so that, those were her paintings, but then she created a room where she hung tree limbs painted white, and you went in and ex sort of experienced the painting, or Steve Sweet, who's now with the Historic New Orleans Collection, he created a, ro a red room, the floor, ceiling, everything was red, you put on red clothing, red mask and everything, and psychologically that impacted you and stuff. So it was just Louisiana artists creating environments. And that was kind of in sync with what was going on nationally. Artists were, you know, moving away from the canvas, some of them. I mean, painting will never die. But um, artists were, were looking into performance art. Um, we had Dalt Wonk doing a performance piece, uh, Splendor Harmonies Rising. We created a cabaret in there. We created uh, two artists, um, Andy Coker, and I uh, forget the other artist's name that he worked with at Novak. They, they created Ooglesic. So they recreated the whole Ooglic experience and had restaurant. the restaurant. And they had the guy, uh, Ding Ding, who was the delivery guy there and stuff. So. It was, it was installations and performance, which were really part of what's happening. Actually, one of the interesting things was Ida Kohlmeyer had designed a, uh, she had a, a large space on the first floor, and we cut holes in the floor down to the basement, and she installed fans, and she had these inflatable tubes, you know, very phallic, very colorful, Mardi Gras colored uh, fabric tool uh, sculptures that you'd step on something and they would inflate. That really led Ida to doing all of her sculpture. She had really never done sculpture before. So to me, that was what the Contemporary Art Center was about, sort of a freedom of, of expression. And, but so again, how did, how did the director provoke that? that or or was, were the, was it a matter of controlling the artists? Um, it was a, a matter of setting up you know, the environment to allow artists freedom of expression. You know, it was sort of like not controlling the, the actual experience. For example, I, I wrote a grant to the Division of the Arts um, to receive some funding to give to each of the artists. We had a call to all the local art community and I was able to, you know, just give money to every one of them. I'm a fairly democratic person. I'm not judgmental in my art. It's like, let's give everybody an opportunity. And everybody really, you know, performs well. And the, the work of art that you may like is different than the work of art that someone else, you know, would like. And to me, it's more about creating an environment that's supportive for artists. How, how did you end up with this four-story building, former headquarters of uh, one of the most visible local corporations at the, at the, t at the very start. Yeah, it, it was pretty amazing. I mean, you know, uh, definitely Sidney Bestoff plays a major role in the whole arts and, you know, evolution in this community. And I believe it was Luba Glade, who was, you know, a gallery owner and art critic. Art critic um, for the State's Item. For the State's Item, and, right. And, and Sidney Bestoff, would you say, was the... the head of Katzen head of Bestoff. And Katzen Bestoff owned the building, but really had no need for the warehouse space. And they had moved out to, I think, Jefferson Parish for their warehousing. So they had an empty building. And I think it was Luba who was, you know, just a very determined person, very, you know, straightforward, good thinker who went to Sydney and said, you know, we're starting this contemporary arts center and we need a place. And uh, I think she had a lot of influence on how it happened. And all of a sudden, this organization with no money had this 80,000 square foot, where four story warehouse with two side warehouses. And that, uh, that, Without that, I don't think things would have been, would have evolved, you know, like they have. And how did you support that? 
the, the, I mean, the overhead yeah. of running that. Well, it was, building. you know, it, it was an interesting sort of, you know, slow building of memberships. And, you know, we had uh, board members and donors like Tommy Coleman and others, um, Graham uh, Stafford, who was a lawyer here at the time, that were supporting contemporary art. And also just, you know, the, the philosophy was, what can we do with nothing? You know, it was basically, how can we, you know, number one, by providing the space, that was a, a huge, you know, contribution to the arts community. And luckily, Sidney Bestoff paid for the utilities. It was, in, at that time, an, an air-conditioned building. Um, and as we developed the, the visual arts space, I remember the first sort of uh, substantial traditional show we did was um, George Duro had called me uh, before I became director of the Contemporary Arts Center and asked about helping him put together a retrospective. And at that time, I was running a space on Wilkinson Row and thinking that was a possibility. But at the same time, I was hired by the Contemporary Arts Center and said, let's, let's do this at the Contemporary Arts Center. And it was kind of interesting because there were artists who felt, well, that's too traditional for the Contemporary Arts Center. But, but George Giroux was too traditional. Right, right. <laughs> traditional as a, as a painter and, you know, that type of thing. And uh, it was a, an amazing experience because George brought in, um, what is the, the architect, Katz, who is no longer with us. Ronald Ronnie, Katz. Ronald Katz came in and we toured the building and he <clears throat> helped us design basically a you know, uh, the space. I mean, we sheetrocked the walls with volunteers and we built, you know, the track lighting, which was basically two by fours with clamp on lights and then d developed a movable wall system with these big, you know, four by 10 panels that would be movable. And, you know, I mean, George Durrell always had great taste. So it was a very elegant transformation. Um, and also, I had an American Express card, so I could charge things and everything. Charge from, things to the contemporary. Well, to me, yeah. from my previous life as having been in a for-profit world and everything, so you know, if we needed carpeting to cover all the holes in the floor or something, um, so it was you know sort of a patchwork of um, a little bit of funding and just a lot of elbow grease coming from the artists, um, while the visual arts scene was was growing. Um, we decided, well, you know, there's a, a, a huge theater community here in need of space. So we then went into the other half of the downstairs, which was more of the warehouse space. The visual arts space was the, the former uh, drugstore pharmacy, and the other half was the warehouse. There was actually an ice cream freezer in there, this huge cement thing, which we all then got sledgehammers and, and you know, beat down. But theater groups like the Shiki Theater and Diversity Players and a lot of the theater community came together. Um, and we ripped down walls and painted and you know, created this theater space um, that then housed numerous theater companies. And again, it was a situation where, um, you know, the rental would be something like, you know, $100 or 20% of your, your take, which was nothing because, you know, theater companies made nothing. So, um, but providing the space for them to create and perform and produce, it and we built two theater spaces. And so there was theater constantly going on in, in the building for many, many years and it helped those theater companies grow. How long did it take for, for you, to, after you started, to build out these theater spaces? Um, the theater pretty much came within the first year. I mean, I was used to historic renovation and sledgehammers and ripping out walls and everything. I, I can rem remember being on, a t on the top of a 10-foot ladder and falling off and landing on my feet. You know, I was like, oh my god, what are we doing here? So. Um, it was just, you know, you, you found people, the artists themselves, coming in and helping to, you know, create this space because it was something that they could use. And then what kind of impact did you find this was having beyond the building? Well, it, it was, we became this, you know, a very much the center for the arts in New Orleans. Uh, and this was roughly 1977, 78, 79, 80. 
And again, I kind of knew that, um, and I enjoyed putting together artists and exhibitions. So if I was to create an exhibition with you know 30 artists um, on a theme that we would have you know 3,000 people come to the opening. So all of a sudden, we were the place where you know artists who were proud to exhibit um, and their followings would come to the openings, and it it built along that lines, and then as the gallery scene developed on Julia Street, I went to the galleries. Just, just a block away. Right. And, and when did that start happening? Um, that was <clears throat> roughly about, I would say probably about 78, somewhere around there. Actually, my mother's gallery, the downtown gallery, was the first gallery on Julia Street, which was my brother and I owned the building that the Children's Museum is in currently. And the downtown gallery was there with the family business, the art supply store, and then Stern Gallery moved from the rink onto Julia Street, and then it just kept moving on. It was a perfect location for Gallery Rose. And would that have, do you think that would not have happened had the Contemporary Art Center not been in the next block? It's, it probably would have happened, but I think the Contemporary Art Center stimulated it tremendously. One of the things that I did, I had previously run some galleries, and um, in gallery world, there's always there was always a feeling like you know we want to keep our patrons away from the other galleries. It was a, a lack of cooperation, and you know when when I was doing galleries, I would always you know list the other galleries you know and try to get them to open on the same night and everything. So when I was at the CAC, I was able to go to the Julia Street galleries and say, if we all open on the same night, then you know we'll attract a larger audience and everyone ends up at the CAC. We'll do an opening with music and the CAC will benefit from this huge influx of people. You know, sort of creating the typical New Orleans celebration. And so all of a sudden, instead of having galleries where seven people would come to an opening, you'd have hundreds. And this was the start of the first Saturday? First Saturday, right. So that and eventually, was, which would lead to the white linen night. Uh, well, it, it then became, you know, then it became thematic. You know, it was just, I think, probably uh, Art for Art's Sake, which was one of the first ones. That was actually uh, a little bit different. That was a, a fundraiser for the Contemporary Arts Center that I think um, Diane Coleman and Gene Nathan and others put together, and artists would exhibit work and the, get, the center would get a percentage. But it, it evolved into an annual event, and the fundraising part went away, but it was still the first Saturday in October that um, the galleries would open and people would go out, and then it just became systematic that with gallery openings roughly being once a month, that at the CAC we would try to also change exhibits at that time, and so there would be this big impact. You know, sort of guerrilla marketing. You know, you, no one had any money, and then eventually it would be well. You know, if everybody created an invitation, I can remember many times sitting there stuffing an envelope with all of our mailing labels, and I knew more about bulk mailing than I should. Um, sending these out so that people would get these invitations to come to these multiple openings, and you can see sort of the impact of now we have you know tens of thousands of people coming out on certain. Saturdays, experiencing art, sort of breaking down the fear that, you know, in the past people were afraid to go into galleries. You'd go into a gallery and, uh, you know, the, the director would kind of, you know, look at you and check you out and realize you didn't have enough money to buy anything there and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. We then created this experience that really broke down those barriers so that I think it had a huge impact of the community then it, coming into galleries, experiencing art, buying art, and supporting the community. Uh, this is, we now call this the Arts District. Right. But when did that <clears throat> start? Did that start in the 1970s? It would be the late 70s when everybody sort of said, you know, my goodness, we have, you know, four galleries. I mean, galleries were attracted then to Julia Street, you know, and back to your, excuse me, back to your question, 
you know, the CAC and the coordinated opening was then meant if you had a gallery, you really needed to be on Julia Street. Arthur Rogers was originally on Magazine Street and had a fantastic gallery there. But then when he moved to, to Julia, others moved to Julia because of the synergy that was going on. And, you know, luckily you have sort of the, the tourist and convention business. So with, you know, wealthy people coming to conventions, the convention center, Julia Street was right there. So they would get a little bit of fallout from that. Was that uh, in the 70s, or did that develop gradually into the it was 1980s really the, and after Well, the, the late 70s and 80s. I mean, by 1979, you had a couple galleries on Julia Street. And previous to that, you know, in the 60s and the 50s, the galleries were all in the French Quarter. And then you saw some moving to Magazine Street. You know, you had Stern move from Royal Street to... Britannia Street at the rink, and Arthur Rogers was the new kid on the block, and he opened up on Magazine Street. And there was, I think Josh Collette had his uh, gallery for fine photography further down on Magazine Street. So Magazine Street, which still is a very viable gallery street, became the second place, but then everyone, you know, the bigger galleries moved to Julia Street in the late 70s. And did um, you have, do you recollect, uh, being in partnership with the preservation movement, which was simultaneously designating the, the old um, early 19th century buildings on, like on Julia Row, right, um, and in the, what, what some people were calling the warehouse district, as historically significant, creating a historic district and landmarks commission. Was that part of development of this arts? District it was in that early stage? subconsciously probably yes, but um, you know there wasn't any real interaction. Um, you know, I mean, PRC was on Julia Street, um, but I know with with the arts movement and particularly the Contemporary Arts Center, um, my interest was also in architecture. So we were always doing architectural shows um, and trying to embrace the architecture community. Um, and we had some great traveling shows. There was a, a show called Collaboration Artists and Architects, which was a national show, and people like Michael Gray is working with a contemporary artist, and that brought in the architects and the designers. We had a wonderful show on uh, the Memphis style. Uh, the great thing about the Contemporary Arts Center is we were flexible. Uh, unlike a museum where you book things two years in advance, if someone contacted me and said they had a show of Memphis furniture, which was the rage across the world at that time, we could book it in three months and all of a sudden, you know, we were really showcasing something that was of interest to that community. Were you getting any help from media at this point? The media, were, I mean, there was a... The, Did they the get print, it? The, yes, the print media got it, and it's it's been interesting to see the evolution of art criticism in this town because the, the Contemporary Art Center was very fortunate in its early days of the Times Picayune in particular. Um, I guess it may have been was it Figaro or Gambit? I forget wh which one followed which one. But um, Figaro was preceded again, but right. But when, but, when did but followed the Vieux Carré Courier? Vieux Carré Courier, right? Um, and you know, you had art criticism, whether it was you know Roger Green or George Jordan, um, writing about the arts and writing about exhibitions on a regular, you know, maybe twice a week basis and everything. And you don't have that anymore. I think that's one of the sadnesses of the way journalism and media has, has changed so radically that, you know, um, you don't have that kind of coverage. And so you had this support where, you know, we would do exhibitions, the galleries in, you know, across town would have exhibitions, the critic would write about it and really promote it. I mean, it's, you know, it's free advertising and we don't have that anymore. You mentioned Luba Glade earlier. The right. The critic who had helped found the center. She also wrote for, I think, the Courier. I think and she started with later, the Courier. The state's item. state's item, right? And she was gutsy. I mean, she, you know, she could rip apart a, an exhibition or be very supportive and stuff. But I mean, you had that kind of, of 
intelligent debate going on, which I think is critical to, you know, I mean, really, probably as much for the artist as the arts community. But, you know, it, the one thing that has been really fantastic about New Orleans is it's embraced the artist for the longest time when you, you know, it's, it's kind of funny when you look at a social page in another city, you're never going to see, you know, artists. You may see, a, you know, a very fancy black tie benefit for the museum or something. But in New Orleans, we've always sort of celebrated, you know, our, our creative spirit, our artistic spirit, our differences. And so um, there was a real support system coming from the media, not necessarily the, the television, but I think the print media has been uh, a critical component of building that kind of support and stimulating the community. Were the artists better off? Uh, were there more artists who were better off in terms of their recognition and financial success as a result of this? I think so. I mean, you had, during that period of time, really sort of the, the mid-70s to the mid-80s, you had um, a very sophisticated gallery system. You had um, some tremendous artists who were coming on the scene, you know, um, and the galleries were very professional. And you also had um, a business community. Um, we had um, Pan American Life Building. Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill came in and commissioned artists on Poydras Street. On Poydras Street, we had done an exhibition called Major Works at the CAC, and we, uh, 40 artists were selected by a curator to create a major work. And that kind of happened at the same time as Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill was, you know, purchasing artwork for the Pan American building. So all of a sudden, a giant painting by Robert Warrens or Ida Kohlmeyer were purchased. So you had collections being built of contemporary artists during this period of time. And I don't think the, it happened across the country, you know, where if you look back, you can see where the oil companies were building art collections. And then all of a sudden, by the mid 80s or 90s, they were selling those off and everything. But we had a, a business community that was supporting some of the major artists at the time, which I'm not sure if that exists anymore. Yeah, we had, um I was just thinking of Joe Canozzo with his two Enrique Alferez sculptures in front of what was then the Louisiana Land Right, Explorer. beautiful pieces. They're still there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, then what happened? Uh, this, this was, you mentioned the oil companies, and New Orleans was right. enjoying an economic boom um, of, of, uh, of some intensity in the 1970s, and that was supporting, you think that was supporting the galleries, the Contemporary Art Center, the artists, it was, was it putting more art in offices and homes as a, res as a result but, of the prosperity? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the economic climate in New Orleans was at a peak at that point and everything. And you, you had, you know, wealthy people who were working with these companies and they were purchasing art and everything. And I think probably, I'm not sure the timing on the, the change from all the energy businesses moving back, you know, to Houston, but it was probably, you know, 1986 or something where you started to see that migration from the city and I think at that point you started to see within the cultural institutions um, financial problems happening and everything and just sort of the struggles uh, I can remember after the Contemporary Arts Center I ran Le Petit Theater and seeing and that was you, you stayed at the CAC I said, for nine years. I was there f uh, from 1977 to 1986, and went to Le Petit Theater. And Le Petit Theater was at you know one of its many ups and downs, a down period, uh, always on the verge of bankruptcy. And um, I had never, I had experienced theater by running two theaters at the Contemporary Arts Center, and so it was kind of a nice challenge to really focus on theater, and was able to build up the, uh, the whole organization within a couple of years by, you know, I think smart programming and marketing, but at the same time, the symphony folded, 
you know. So all of a sudden, Le Petit Theatre went from almost bankruptcy to being the largest subscription organization in the city, um, and it was by a, default. By default, you know, and also just going, you know, I mean, we were swinging up, and you know. Larger organizations with with huge financial burdens were, were collapsing, and everything. The, the uh, 1984 World's Fair was in the Contemporary Arts Center neighborhood, right? The Arts District neighborhood, right? Um, and it, uh, it it left behind an uh, interest in restoring the warehouse district and residential use of those buildings, but it wasn't a financial success. Did it have an impact on art? A tremendous impact. I think that, um, in a sense, that sort of 1976 to 1984 was the the real period, sort of a, in a sense, a golden age of the arts in New Orleans. Um, you had the architectural community exploding with really brilliant people who had come in and were working in the city and. You know whether it was through Perez for the you know for uh, the World's Fair or some of the other architects here, there was an excitement in architecture um, of young again young baby boomers who were educated who were doing creative things and looking you know in a more worldly view of postmodernism or or whatever. So that um, I think the the World's Fair uh, stimulated was sort of the the final stimulus of a period where you could sort of track the contemporary growth of the city. You know, that uh, I think after the World's Fair, we kind of, with, with the economy changing um, and losing the, the, the energy companies and stuff, um, I, th I think after the World's Fair, we started to settle back into becoming a very staid, traditional City struggling financially, struggling to support the the arts organizations, and it really wasn't until post Katrina that kind of shook things up. Um, you know, economically, Katrina has brought a great deal of money into this community. It's brought a lot of young people, creative people, who discovered New Orleans because of Katrina coming down to volunteer or all the. The consciousness of the importance of New Orleans, and we've, you know, that right now I think is the second contemporary wave of artistic talent. Do you see them as, as parallel or comparable? Uh, that wave from the '76 to '84 and the present post-Katrina years. I, I think it's, you know, it, it's the two periods, and they're very similar um, because you, you know, again, in the the '70s you had the baby boomers, the educated baby boomers who were coming out of, of, you know, art schools, performing art schools, visual art schools, who um, were creating a much larger arts community. I mean, before that time, post, you know, World War II or World War II, you didn't have a lot of people coming out of art schools, you know, that was the last thing your parents wanted you to do. You sort of had this, okay, we've got more people now. So, you know, yes, you're going to have more people who are artists. And you had that wave of young creative people, idealistic, um, who made their living in the arts. And then I think um, demographically and, you know, all that good stuff that, you know, it hasn't been until really, you know, this post Katrina period where, again, you have this explosion of the numbers of young people coming out of, of, you know, educational institutions. I mean, you look at post-Katrina New Orleans and the theater department at NYU has had a huge impact of all these young kids coming from New York to New Orleans and starting the NOAA project and, you know, moving to New Orleans. And I mean, the city is, is thriving with young educated people in the arts and I think it's just a, a you know a massive number of people again like we had back in the you know the 70s. What's serving the purpose now of the Contemporary Arts Center today? Well I think you've in the visual arts the St. Claude Arts District um, you've got a lot of really young idealistic people and they've created you know galleries and cooperatives 
and it's been interesting to watch you know the evolution of that that whole scene um, of Saint Claude, um, which was you know before Katrina depressed, and the you know the the influx of these young people and the coffee shops that open and the galleries that open and the bike stores that open, um, the healing center. Um, you can see this slow rebirth, you know, of of that that particular part of town. So. There's also theater spaces, um, you know, that are small. Um, as far as the traditional institutions, I think it's really been the Ogden that has, you know, understood the importance of supporting the local artist. I mean, the, the Ogden um, really has evolved into presenting um, major exhibitions on New Orleans artists and continues to do that. I think that, um, in a sense, in the visual arts, the Ogden has kind of taken over from the Contemporary Arts Center um, in that role. And the Ogden started up just before Katrina, and it right. really um, cranked up its presence, its energies right after Katrina. Yeah. But well, does, so does what you see on St. Claude and <clears throat> uh, in that arts district now remind you of the the Julia Street and the Contemporary Arts it, it reminds me of the artist and the energy and the, the smartness of these artists coming together and, and wanting to have a place to, you know, exhibit work. A lot of it's non-commercial. Um, I, I think there's a missing element today in that the Contemporary Arts Center was a central location that brought basically the support system of Uptown New Orleans, the financial support system of Uptown New Orleans, and engaging people with money, with the artist. Um, living downtown now in the Bywater, I know that most of the artists who go to the openings, the people who go to the openings, are from that neighborhood and don't have the money. So we're missing the support system I think for you know in you know supporting the artists that are here. I think that's that's still a critical need for the city. Taking us back to the the period of that we were talking about the seventies, early eighties, the World's Fair. What was great artistically? Well, what stands out in your mind artistically about the the World's Fair? Well, I think the the design element. Um, I mean, one one of the sadnesses for me is the wonder wall going away. It just seems like, why couldn't we have figured out a way to coat it in polyurethane? Well, I mean, the wonder wall was, I guess, the ultimate postmodern uh, design of trying to disguise the power lines going down um, Convention Boulevard. And it had nooks and crannies of shops and flying angels and flags, and it looked like you know some sort of Renaissance fair. It had giant alligators and everywhere, mermaids and right. Neptunes. Right, right, and and certainly even you know some of the things we you know we we have today. I think I believe some of the the drinks on Bourbon Street were created there and stuff. So there was a a real excitement of newness and the opportunities. Unfortunately, you know, doing a fair in New Orleans in the summer, you know, when it's so hot, I think had a lot of problems. And you look at the location of New Orleans, it's, you know, you can only draw from, you know, the people north of you, unless you're selling to the fish or something. So, um, but you had the Wonder Wall. There was a Frank Gehry, it was designed by Frank Gehry. Right, the amphitheater. that nobody had heard of in 1984. Right, his or amphitheater. amphitheater. Right, which unfortunately no longer exists. I mean, the, the amphitheater, the Wonder Wall, and I remember there was a, I guess it was the Emperor's Walk or something that was sort of hidden, but it was, I guess the Chinese government must have paid for it, but it was this wonderful area that you, you know, sort of a walkway with these giant timbers and very traditional, you know, Chinese architecture that, and then the, uh, the water park that was there for the kids, you know, and you didn't have that many kids going, but I guess that kind of predates the, the wonderful experience at the zoo. So you had so many really interesting elements. You also had um, in the Louisiana Pavilion a major exhibition of the visual arts and everything. And, you know, different artists got great exposure. 
I think uh, the always entertaining and wonderful George Smith had his own studio there that artists, you know, people could pass by and engage with him as he created works of art. And then in the, uh, I guess in the, the Federal Fiber Mill building, you had Nick Spitzer creating this whole uh, music cultural experience of presenting, you know, Cajun artists and Zydeco artists and folk artists and things. So um, there's a great deal of excitement. Um, it may just have been too big for the city to, you know, to do. Did, did that help, did that mask the idea, the impending end of the, the oil boom and the support for the arts? Uh, or did you, did you feel it was, that decline was underway already, even as the fair was going? I, I don't think we noticed any change. I, I think maybe it was, you know, maybe the, the, the bookend. You know, and you know, it, it was sad to see all the political problems and the controversy and the news coverage, the negative coverage of the World's Fair. Um, and you know, it it just was something that I think was too large of a vision for this city to maintain. Now, if you did it today with the the tourism that we have, it could probably support itself in some way. But I think it was sort of you know, too early, or in New Orleans, I've always found you plant the seed of something and, you know, you get a few people out, whether it was Jazz Fest or the French Quarter Fest, when, you know, just a, a few in the know go. And then if you're able to sustain it over the years, it, it becomes a monster. You know, I mean, look at, I, I was in... A, a, good, a good monster? A good monster, you know, but still, you know, sort of, you know, you look at, you know, I was at Le Petit Theater and involved with, you know, the early days of the French Quarter Fest. And it was a nice little quiet, wonderful experience and charming and very European and everything. And now everybody in the world comes. And so, you know, you have a huge number of people experiencing that. But I think, you know, had, had the World's Fair almost been sort of an annual thing, you know, using that site by now we would be turning away millions of people coming for it and stuff. Um, I want to get into music and the jazz, mm -hmm. but I, before we leave the art scene, you were instrumental in uh, launching a Mardi Gras organization that was a reflection of the contemporary arts. Right, I right. Well, it the was Crew of Clones. Crew of Clones, which was... 1977? Uh, let's see, 19... Crew of Clones was probably 1977. And that was a, a, a good example. Actually, I, I noted 1978. Okay. On 78, the, okay. But that might be wrong. And uh, probably 78. We, I think 77 we were still you know, doing our, our things, but uh, a very talented artist named Denise Bellon had graduated from UNO. She had done a performance piece for her thesis as a Mardi Gras ball. And Denise, I remember meeting her. Uh, I was upstairs on the second floor trying to take down these gigantic fluorescent light box figures with Wayne Amade, an artist who had done a tremendous amount of volunteering at, at the center in the early days, was struggling to try to take all these, you know, lighting fixtures which had been, you know, in this sort of gigantic open office area in the KB warehouse to create a, a theater space. And we're up on, you know, some used table or something struggling and Denise Vallon walks in and starts talking about her projects and art and everything. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm trying to, you know, not kill myself. And again, that, that attitude of the CAC of embracing, you know, whoever came through the door. And so, you know, that led to basically sort of taking her senior thesis and doing it at the Contemporary Arts Center. Um, we did the first crew of clones in the gallery. We created a uh, Arts of Mardi Gras exhibition with Joe Barth's sculpture and different artists who had been doing Mardi Gras works and uh, somehow had enough money or whatever to hire the Neville brothers, uh, paid an, uh, an artist who had moved here and lived here for many years from Houston, Kevin Combs, who was an amazing young graphic designer. Um, and had Kevin did a backdrop for the Neville brothers of New Orleans underwater. 
and we, you had this whole panoramic view of New Orleans with the Superdome underwater, the entire city. And I kind of think back on those times, and I think, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I don't even know if there's there's artistic panels still exist anywhere, but we had a it was performance art, and I think. Uh, Steve Sweet came in as the Burning Ralt Center building, and we had um, uh, Jane, Man the headless Jane Mansfield, as one of the queens and everything. So all you know, all these people coming for this party, the first crew of clones, which was just a party at that time, um, was performance art and a performance by the Neville Brothers, and you know a huge success. You know the CAC was a great party place. You know. And the next year, I had written a grant to the state for a project called Sculpture in Motion. And we hired visual artists, including Lynn Emery, to create floats that we then pulled through, you know, uh, the warehouse district, toasting the king and queen at the Hummingbird Grill. During Mardi Gras Dur season? During Mardi Gras season. That would have been 79? In 79, yeah. Uh, somewhere right around there. And um, it kind of basically, Crew of Clones then engaged. New Orleans is a, a neighborhood city with a lot of groups that sort of hang out in neighborhood bars and everything. So um, you had a lot of these different groups, and some of them had already had this sort of marching tradition, you know, and um, they formed their own crews. And, you know, the museum had a crew. I remember one time they dressed as uh, Van Gogh and threw ears to the, the public and everything. And it was a, an outrageous parade for artists. And at the same time, everybody was an artist. Everybody who was in a crew was an artist. And you came up with creative ideas. And we always had an interesting theme. And I'm not sure the number of years um, it went on, but it kept growing in each year. Again, planting that seed, you start off small, you know, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, it's out of control. Were there any precedents to uh, rethinking the traditional Mardi Gras? Uh, was this, was this a, as a departure, the first one? Well, I think, you know, New Orleans has had its, its momuses and, and other things, but this was sort of, again, this, this fresh, you know, all these new baby boomer creative people, you know, you know, really celebrating New Orleans culture and allowing them to participate in Mardi Gras. And so, you know, it was really coordinating all these individual groups, uh, them coming up with some crazy ideas. I mean, I, I wish we had been collecting the throws that had been, you know, given out and everything. And there were always some outrageous, you know, sort of X-rated things that were happening. and. Occasionally, we, we would try to legitimize it and have performance artists from New York, or one year Emory Clark did art cars, and we had artists designing cars and you know changing them. And that actually, it's interesting, art cars, we had all these artists. We were, we were working closely with the artists in Houston. Houston had a contemporary art museum, and a lot of those artists who were gaining national reputations came over, designed some art cars. Um, Houston now has an art car museum because of that parade. We didn't continue the tradition, but they have taken it on and, and do a great job with and, it. And then you, I think you were about to talk about the clones changed or well, it, it morphed grew. into Well, it grew and grew, and in fact, the last year, um, you know, it was very large. We we finally moved the ball to the president, and that I mean, the siege. Yeah, we which voting. we greatly miss in this town. If only we still had it. Um, but we had, I think it was the Neville Brothers, Jimmy Buffett, and Bette Midler. And it was quite an evening. And I think the theme may have been celebrity tragedies, you know, and stuff like that. And I think, you know, Gene Nathan was, um, what was the actress who drowned? Um, Anyway, there was, a, you know, there was a boat, and then she was Natalie Wood, you know. And so, I mean, everybody went off on their crazy tangents. And the Contemporary Art Center at the same time was becoming, you know, because of it, its growth and the need to become institutionalized and its support system, there were forces within the board that felt this was not the image that we should have for the Contemporary Art Center. And so there was this pushback of, you know, 
About when was this? Um, this was probably, I think 1984 was Celebrity Tragedies or something like that, right around that time. And so you had a few members of the board who, from Uptown who didn't like the image of you know, whatever we were doing in the streets of New Orleans, although it was making, quite frankly, a lot of money. You know, I think the last ball that I was involved in, we cleared $20,000 for the CAC, which was a lot of money at that time. And then there were some internal bickerings with the different crews, and there was an uh, the sub crews, and there was an uh, you know the 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 group that kind of controlled the the clones, Denise Vallon and others, um, were reacting, I think, to the board and saying we have to control this and we can't do this and we can't do that. And so there was sort of this this revolution within the organization and kind of. Ex exploded or imploded. And at that time, um, I was, uh, my, my whole life was changed. My wife had come down with cancer in, in, in 83, uh, passed away in 84. Um, I was changing and um, had at one point moved on to Le Petit Theater. And it, you know, right at that point also the Im implosion of the crew of clones and it really, you know, it ended there. And which kind of made me sad. So when I was, when I moved on to Le Petit Theater, um, felt that, you know, at, there was a couple years where people were trying to get the clones back together and it didn't work. And I had seen in the paper where a couple of the sub crews were marching and were busted by the police department. And I think some of the crew of clones people had called the police on them, you know, just for whatever, bad blood or whatever. And I thought, well, you know, we need to organize these people, you know, and I thought, well, here I am at Le Petit Theater, let's do a, a Mardi Gras fundraiser. And I called some of the sub crew heads and invited them to my house and said, let's, I'd like to form a, a French Quarter version of the clones. I remember as a kid seeing the parades going down Royal Street, which was just glorious. The traditional remember, parades before they were yeah, banned, restricted. you know, for, for good reason, you know, the flambeau carriers going down Royal Street and everything. And oddly enough, I went to file for a permit and found out that if we started the Saturday two Saturdays before Mardi Gras. We were technically outside of the Mardi Gras season. It was the, the Mardi Gras season started on that Sunday. If we did the prayer on Saturday, we could march through the French Quarter. So I purchased the permit, contacted the crews, got dragged, I forget what production we were doing at Le Petit Theater, but you know, dragged Becky Allen and company and everybody to the streets and we basically, you know, formed up on Wilkinson Row, had the crews, decided at that point to hire um, brass bands as the, the marching music. And there were no floats for the first couple of years and sort of, you know, took off and we're walking down past uh, St. Louis Cathedral and there's nobody there and we're going down Charter Street and there's nobody there and then all of a sudden we turn and come back down Royal Street and of course all the tourists were there and going, my God, what is this weird group of people with brass bands and everything. What did you call it then? Um, it was the Cru de Boucare. You know, it was Le Petit Théâtre de Boucare. So it was the Cru de Boucare, which has been basically, you know, it's now the Cru de Bou and everything. But it was started sort of as a fundraiser for Le Petit Theater, which wasn't a good fit for the organization. I mean, here I was sort of coming from the Contemporary Arts Center tradition and finding myself running a very, very, very traditional New Orleans organization. So it didn't ever become associated with, you know, the theater. I kind of did it on the side, like I'm often, you know, to do, you know, have these side projects, you know, and everything. So, um, and then just the, the, the crews themselves, uh, the strength of, of their passion for this thing has really taken it to another level. You know? So the crew de Hood continues ever right. stronger? Yes. You were even the, the king a couple right. of years ago. Well, for the 25th anniversary, it's funny, I mean, I, I like to start things, I like the ideas behind it, that's how I got 
involved in starting the Tennessee Williams Festival and the film festivals. You know, I like the ideas that New Orleans needs to, to do these things or it's a crazy idea. So, you know, for the first year of the Crew de Vue, basically, I financially underwrote all the activities. The second year was a, sort of a participant, but knew at that point that all these passionate crews were, you know, up and running. So I didn't participate for, you know, the third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh year or whatever, and then I moved away briefly. And then I uh, was invited to participate again in one of the sub-crews. And then for the 25th anniversary, they honored me by selecting me as the, the king, which was a, a fun experience. I and mean, if you've never, you know, ridden down Royal Street on a float throwing cups to screaming thousands of people, it's really a, a great experience, you know. It's a great one. It was fun. Um, we uh, like to keep going unless you would like to take a break. I'm fine. Because I want to I, shift into sure. music right. to a certain uh, and uh, particularly jazz fest. But Good. What, so if the art scene uh, in New Orleans didn't get didn't continue to get support from mm -hmm. the economy, right? In the 1980s, it seems that the music scene took off from from its 1970s base of, of discovery and kept getting bigger and bigger. Or am I? Uh, I, think, I think you're, you're right at that. Well, I think, why, well, why did music do that and art not? Well, the, the visual arts scene has pretty much remained local. You know, I mean, we, we, we celebrate our, our artists here. Occasionally, an artist will be recognized nationally. But in the music scene, um, you know, you've had this, you know, huge tradition you know, international recognition of New Orleans. Primarily, people think internationally of New Orleans as a jazz center, the birthplace of jazz. But, you know, and, and I loved, grow again, I feel very lucky to have been born in 1950, so by the time I was in junior high and high school, we were going to dances with Irma Thomas and Benny Spellman and you know, Deacon John and Valencia, and you know, we were we were part of that whole you know R and B explosion, and out of that came the Neville Brothers, and I think the Neville Brothers are the one group that really brought national attention to New Orleans music again. You know, you had you had a lot of national attention for the R and B movement here, and Alan Toussaint and all the amazing work that he was doing, but that kind of fell out of favor. You know, with the the national scene, which was now, you know, you, you had Woodstock and you had an explosion, and the whole music culture exploded, um, starting with Woodstock. But New Orleans um, could have been left behind totally had it not been for the Neville Brothers, and they came out of the R and B movement and stuff. But they were recognized nationally, so that kind of put a different focus. I mean, you were at least getting Rolling Stone and other publications to recognize New Orleans music. And at the same time, you've always had this family tradition in this city. You know, that's what's pretty unique is the music families of New Orleans and the neighborhoods and the fact that kids would go to their grandmother's house or uncle's house and, and there would be music. Um, I've always been amazed at some of the things we've done and realized that, you know, this jazz musician is really what they are today because their aunt taught opera at Xavier. You had that whole Creole music tradition and everything, very formal, classical training, yet, you know, it sort of is the basis for jazz in, in many respects. But you had, you know, Tipitina's forming, which was sort of like the Contemporary Arts Center about the same time where that was the support system. We were doing, at the CAC, a lot of music performances and stuff, had gotten some grants from the National Endowment for the Arts for jazz performances, and um, actually was one of the first places where punk music was being allowed to be performed. But I think with Tipitina's and the Neville Brothers, you had this uh, the, the parallel to the visual arts energy that was going on where you know, they were happening simultaneously. So, but, uh, and a lot of music was 
locally consumed as you, as the dances right. you went to with Irma Thomas. I remember when Rolling Stone decided to put the meters on the front in, in the to put the meters in the Rolling Stone magazine in 1972 right. with right. A, with a Timothy Krauss, one of their best writers, discovering mm -hmm. that. Discovering, right. So There's a lot of that was happening. People were, 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 right. were being, quote, discovered, unquote, right. in that period. And, the, and to go back, I'd like to go back to the Jazz Fest that you mentioned. Um, you, you attended the first of the Jazz Fests at, at the Fairgrounds in right. right. I was there too. Right. The, uh, <laughs> I thought that was normal, but I learned later it wasn't. The um, the, the Jazz Fest uh, fed into this Tipitina's, uh, the ability to found the Tipitina's was because, would, would you agree with me, there was an increasing consciousness of the riches of music that New Orleans and Louisiana right. had, right. weren't giving enough attention previously. Well, you had, you had, I mean, it's, it's interesting to look back on things and just see, you know, what happened and had that not happened, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. But, you know, with the Jazz Fest, you had in the, you know, the late 60s, the business community coming together and saying, we need to do an event that recognizes jazz and impacts tourism. And there were some, some major jazz festivals put together that were basically indoor concerts at Municipal New Auditorium, Orleans. yeah, with, you know, Louis Armstrong. And I mean, just, you know, when you look up to the lineup of this pre-jazz fest as we know at time period in the late 60s, um, it was pretty phenomenal, but it didn't make it financially. And this group of business people, you know, um, was pretty persistent, and they were smart enough to bring in George Ween, who had been doing Newport Folk Jazz Festival, and was sort of the the main person who could really help. And you know, his belief, uh, not to speak for him, was that there was so much here mm -hmm. that he, you know, felt that you can celebrate. The different aspects of New Orleans culture. So, um, whether it was the food with Vaucrasson being one of the first vendors and is still a vendor today, or, and the different, you know, the different things that we think of New Orleans cuisine being presented, you know, in a in a festival environment. I mean, there was the nighttime concerts, but there was the outdoor festival. You know, which was kind of a unique experience. And that's what George Ween said distinguished the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival from his successful Newport Jazz Festival right. because you had the Heritage Fair aspect. It's the Heritage Fair he, that, uh, yeah. Was, that was he his, the one who insisted on that? I believe so. I think that was his real passion and belief that, you know, we, we need to look and celebrate all these different aspects of what makes New Orleans still a unique cultural community. Um, so the first jazz fest that he produced in 1970 right. in Congo Square right. with only a few hundred people showing up. Right. We always say there were, there were more performers than there were audience members. And you have these wonderful photographs of somebody performing on this very tiny stage with three people there. And, you know, just, I mean, there was a, a very strong connection with Preservation Hall and the Jaffees, and I think they were very instrumental in the growth. And you, that brought in Sister Gertrude Morgan and, you know, the, uh, Joseph Bornstein, you know, his involvement in the community in the 60s is, is monumental, but Noel Rockmore and, you know, the artistic community coming in. One of my favorite things about looking at the Jazz Fest in 1970 are the films of the Mardi Gras Indians parading down Canal Street. And I don't know if there had ever been a Mardi Gras Indian parade down Canal Street before that, but I think it took someone like a George Ween to sort of see all of this that we often take for granted or not even aware of. I mean, I grew I would think that the Mardi Gras Indians might be an example of something that was sort of a secret even in New Orleans at that time. Right. I mean, I, I have to confess, I mean, growing up in New Orleans, you know, and though I had been to Preservation Hall and other things as a kid, I 
I didn't live know in it. Certain neighborhoods, right. That was a neighborhood thing. Know, right. You you didn't know the Mardi Gras Indians existed. And I think, you know, that's one of the really great great things about Jazz Fest is it started off the right way by celebrating all the different cultures, you know, in this city, and crossing, you know, cultural, you know, lines and racial lines and everything. I mean, again, here is a. You know, this could have been the first Mardi Gras Indian parade that came out of the neighborhood. And through the years, just by exposing the culture, you know, whether it's to the New York Times photographer or whatever, I think that Jazz Fest doing that early on has been responsible for the continued growth of these unique traditions in this city. In the, the racial element uh, comes up mm -hmm. you have, in order to make these discoveries. Uh, uh, culture has to cross uh, racial right. lines, and one of the things that George Weems has said sheds some light, perhaps, on the 1960s. In contrast to the early 1970s, he said that he was asked in 1962 by some New Orleans businessmen who wanted to promote a jazz festival mm -hmm. to come here, but he found that they still were um, bound by uh, segregationist ideas, and he Correct. wasn't even sure that if he brought in musicians, they'd be able to stay in a hotel. Right. We had, you had laws against So that. he declined. He right. declined to, to found the jazz right. fest in 1962. Well, they kind of point out, I believe it was in 1968, when the Pro Bowl was NFL Pro Bowl was to be in New Orleans, and when African American athletes were not allowed to stay in our hotels, and the Pro Bowl moved, I think, to Dallas or something, no, see, yeah. then people kind of said, "Oops, you know, we need to fix this problem." You know, whether it was their personal belief or not, but they realized that New Orleans could not exist with that kind of racism and discrimination and stuff. So, um, and, and George being married to an African-American woman, I think he understood the complexities of these, these situations and stuff. So um, once that happened in 68 and the business community kind of said, you know, we can't do this anymore, that changed a lot of things in New Orleans and Jazz Fest then could proceed. Now, George Wien did also, correct me on this, but as I understand it, in 1968 he was approached about running Jazz Fest. Right. But he was told that the mayor, I guess then Cooper Stiro, uh, would have been embarrassed by having a festival promote, promoted by a producer who was married to an African American woman. It's possible. And certainly we could all, under, you know. Is that? I, I don't know. I mean, I, and I know in, in George. George's wonderful book, he covers a lot of that. So I, I think there was a lot of sensitivity there, you know, and some real problems. Then before the, the, the 1970 Jazz Fest in Congo Square, mm -hmm. we had the election of 1969 right. 1970, in which Moon Landrieu made it clear that he was uh, going to integrate the city as much as America did. Right. Do you think, did that have an effect on? Uh, successive Jazz Fest? It certainly had a supportive effect. I mean, I think it had an effect on all of us living here and everything. And it was, you know, the, the times are finally somewhat changing. You know, I mean, the, the, I mean, Moon Landry was brilliant in embracing, you know, the, the African American community, bringing people into government, you know, and trying to do things the way they have, should have been done. And I think, you know, these things, you know, help develop a, you know, a, a better climate for Jazz Fest. I mean, at the same time, you have George Weems, you know, saying, you know, uh, to Quint Davis, who was a, a student at Tulane, Allison Caslow, Allison Minor Caslow, um, to go out in the community and go to Mardi Gras Indian practices and, and find what is the real culture here. And, you know, in a sense, let's, you know, let's give some support to artists like Professor Longhair and James Booker and others that had been neglected for so many years. And I think, again, you know, uh, I think Jazz Fest has a great deal of great karma for starting off the right way and, you know, really 
being open and honest and celebrating the, the, the true culture of New Orleans. And I think George Ween helped direct us in that way. And, you know, over the years, just the growth of Jazz Fest. And, I mean, it's phenomenal the numbers of people who come from away. You know, we have, you know, passionate uh, people coming from all parts of the country who um, make an annual trek to New Orleans. Um, they get exposed to our culture. They love our culture. They become addicted to our culture. They move to New Orleans. I mean, the, the, the numbers of people who I've come in contact with that moved to New Orleans because they came to Jazz Fest for the first time and couldn't believe that people in America could enjoy culture like we do on a regular basis. So, you know, hats off to George Ween and all those in the early days of recognizing the, the true New Orleans and bringing it forward and really celebrating it. And that has, you know, had a tremendous impact on the continuation and support for the music traditions. And, you know, it's fun at Jazz Fest to see the excitement in all the music clubs and the streets are packed with people from away and locals who are, you know, going to every club imaginable. I've never seen so many options for, you know, experiencing music at one point in time as at Jazz Fest time and stuff, so. But that's the case now and, and has been right. for a long time, but Jazz Fest took off pretty quickly in the 1970s. Yeah. Well, you, again, you had, um, I think, you know, parallel to what we've discussed about, you know, the, 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 the creative people in this city, you know, the architects, the artists, uh, the musicians, that um, there was an audience that, you know, was sort of, you know, parallel to the Woodstock generation. I mean, you had all of that going on at the same time. Um, music was exploding nationally, um, and it was fortunate that Jazz Fest was an early festival that was allowed to organically grow, and I think moving to the fairgrounds, which is an amazing facility for a festival. I mean, all the infrastructure that's there, people don't really appreciate or understand, has allowed it to grow to the point where, you know, it can, it can handle the numbers of people that come to Jazz Fest, and they still, even though they're, you know, often in a large crowd, they're still, I think Jazz Fest is probably the happiest place in the universe when it's happening. You know, people are happy to be there, they're happy to be able to really experience the culture and celebrate with us and everything. In, did you get help from city government or the business community? I mean, you were, you were on the well, board. Well, I was on the board at the time. The so and, you, you know, there, there's, the there's been a, a real growth in support. Um, I mean, the city and the police department, the fire department, the medical community have always been extremely supportive of Jazz Fest. I mean, you know, it's, it's basically creating a city within a city. Um, and over the last couple of years, certainly um, because of the tourism financial support that the state or, or the city may have, that's come into play for Jazz Fest. Um, so there, there's been a, a very positive relationship there. Um, Jazz Fest, as it's matured, has um, developed a phenomenal uh, support system with sponsorship. I mean, if you look at other major festivals across the country, their sponsorship support is marginal, you know, and Jazz Fest, because of the types of people that it attracts, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, the right demographics. It's educated people who are passionate about life and, you know, it's so... It's a lot of those same baby boomers that you were talking well, about. The, right. The baby boomers are, are aging as we're all out there, you know, slowing down a little bit. And it's, you know, it, it is a, you know, it, you know, we're constantly looking at, you know, bringing in the next generation. You know, that's why, you know, new talent, younger talent, younger audiences is important to us. 
but um, the the support you know of jazz fest. I mean, you know, when you look at post Katrina with Shell coming in as the title sponsor, which Jazz Fest had never had a title sponsor, the the amazing support that Shell has given the city and Jazz Fest is phenomenal. I don't know whether because you know it's a Dutch company originally that understands cities and floods and could you know corporately think of well you know we understand you, but um, you know the Acura stage, the Honda Motor Companies, um, People's Health Network here in New Orleans and everything. So um, it's an amazing model, you know. And when I look at the fact that it was started from day one as a cultural event and a nonprofit, and I've had a lot of experience running nonprofits, and I know the, the life of a nonprofit is a tough one of trying to financially survive. For the brilliance of people coming together and forming Jazz Fest, which is a, an event and somewhat of a fundraiser that supports a foundation that then distributes mm -hmm. uh, support to the community. I mean, we have an extensive a uh, number of grant programs and other events and a free music education program that will soon have its own beautiful home next door here on Rampart Street. Um, there, I don't know if any other nonprofit in this country exists that's like the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. How long did it take for the foundation to start generating uh, income that could be plowed back in the community. What, was it in the late 70s? Or? Um, it was sort of um, the, the late 70s. I mean, I remember I was actually, because of my role with the Contemporary Arts Center, um, I became a member of the, the, the board here. And that was sort of, I guess, 78, 79, 80-ish, or you know, somewhere in that period. And actually, you know, I was fortunate to be on the board when we started the grant program. And I remember looking at the state and the NEA's process and sort of crafting a form and everything so, you know, we could give out money to other organizations and artists. So, you know, a nonprofit that gives money to other nonprofits and artists is, is again, a unique thing. And that role was established pretty early, right? Right. I mean, the, the founders, George Ween, or the investors like Arthur Davis, could have privatized it and right. turned it into a for-profit. It certainly could have been a for-profit organization, um, and there were there was I mean there there's historically a little bit of history about people fighting over that, and I think um, Allison Miner and and others were instrumental in saying this really needs to be a nonprofit organization, and fortunate for this city that it that's what happened. And the, by the time we got to the end of the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, the Jazz Fest board had achieved a, a degree of community representation that right. wasn't really typical of New Orleans. I think it was, right. but it was in approximately 78 or 79 when the majority of the board of the, of the foundation was African American. Was that I'm not sure well, what the right percentage. I know, I know, I mean, there's an interesting part of our history that we're now, you know, we have an archive. And um, I've been fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with the archive and look at our history, and I'm interested in it. And um, I was also fortunate to be on the board when, um, in the late 70s, when the African American community basically came to the board and said, you're excluding African Americans in certain areas. Certainly on the, on the musical stages, we had African Americans performing. But as far as the vendors and the craftspeople, um, it was traditionally a pretty much white type of thing. I mean, the crafts movement in the United States has been people in North Carolina throwing pots and doing those wonderful things and stuff, very creative. But you had, say, the vendors on Canal Street, African-American vendors, who were excluded and felt that they were being excluded. And there were other areas of Jazz Fest where um, community felt it was being excluded. So you had um, sort of a, a protest movement you know, going on um, 
and you know people coming into the board meetings and demanding that change happen. Um, and there are a lot of important people who are involved in that movement. And you know, again, much to the credit of this organization, you know, it confronted those issues. And you know, we're looking at uh, doing something on the history of Congo Square. Um, where a lot of these things were happening. At first, Congo Square, which is you know an area at Jazz Fest that has merchants and performance stages and demonstrations and exhibitions, um, was called Coindu. And there was a community group of artists and writers and, and, and others who came together and actually formed a, uh, an organization, and the Jazz Fest basically commissioned them to run Coindu. So Coindu was the predecessor to Congo Square. And so I, I feel very good that this organization, you know, um, dealt with these issues properly and, you know, didn't, you know, turn people away and, and listened. And this, you know, the, the Jazz Fest evolved, I think, to the most diverse board in the city of a nonprofit. I mean, most organizations have boards of directors that are either all white or all black in this city. And I think Jazz Fest has consciously made an effort to be reflective of this community, not only on race, but also economic background. Do you think that's had an impact on other organizations? As an, as an example for them? Um, I don't know if people are really as aware of that. I know I, you know, it's a good question. I don't know. It, it probably has had some effect, but um, you know, I think, I think that there are organizations who, who attempt to do that, but it's um, nonprofit boards are a very complex situation. And I know just being involved in them, you know, th there's always the um, you know, give, get, or get off type of philosophy. So that means, you know, we only want board members who are going to give money or, or get money from their friends, which when you take that attitude, it's usually, you know, basically going to be looking at the, the white uptown establishment and stuff. So that kind of is a, a, f a fact with nonprofits, you know, particularly traditional sort of Eurocentric type of cultural organizations and everything. But um, again, because of the diversity of this board, we were able to develop programs that support this community in many different ways. And um, you know, I think it's a pretty amazing history that the numbers of types of programs that have, where we've tried to respond to community needs um, is amazing, and having the, the financial ability to do that, which most organizations don't. So it's, it's just a unique model that, you know, Harvard Business School should be studying or something, you know. But that was in place and evident by the time we got to 1980 or certainly 1984 right. World's but, Fair. Right, by that time. Okay. Another thing, another strand that we've been following is, is the food. In, in, right. in addition to <clears throat> the artists uh, arriving and, and uh, finding a congenial environment and the, the mm -hmm. music being discovered on Jazz Fest, uh, providing a platform, and the uh, Moonlanders election providing a, a sort of a, a end to the segregation um, right. atmosphere, we had the discovery of food in New Orleans, even though we've had food for hundreds of years. Did that sh show up? At, at, uh, we, Jazz Fest seemed to be one of the main showcases for that. I think it, what do you recall? Well, I think it exposed a lot of uh, neighborhood traditions, and I mean, you know, New Orleans has always had a, a, a rich, rich f food history. Great restaurants, internationally known restaurants, and certainly when you had sort of the this new movement in the 70s with Paul Prudhomme, and I can remember going to his place on, you know, on Charter Street for lunch, and it was five dollars, and we would all be hanging out and having this incredible meal and everything. Um, and you know, the, the food uh, community started to uh, get a lot more national exposure, and um, again, that that whole younger baby boomer element 
was looking for food experiences as entertainment and everything. Um, and I think, you know, it was sort of the, the next wave of, of the, you know, the food arts in New Orleans. And we're, we're again seeing it post Katrina. But Jazz Fest, I think because it went into a lot of neighborhoods and cultures that weren't really recognized at that time and presenting you know, this amazing food that was be, being created in, in neighborhood kitchens and things, that it helped parallel this growth and help you know, really get us to the point where we are today. Because it's a festival where you go to a lot of festivals and there's hot dogs and hamburgers and funnel cakes and God knows what else. And that's just not allowed at Jazz Fest, you know, although we do have Lucky Dogs um, because that is a New Orleans tradition. But I mean, you know, it's been a place where um, you're getting some of the most amazing food, you know, served to thousands of people. I mean, how they can turn out a, a Munier sauce, you know, for thousands of people each day or these amazing... And like the variety, of, the variety of the musical genres, right. there was this, this food variety already existed. Exactly. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate to have all of these things. I mean, there's... Do you think that is, is playing a part along with Jazz Fest, uh, Richard Collin was the first restaurant critic in New Orleans, mm -hmm. um, first in his underground gourmet book and later writing in the State's Item. Right, the State's Item. I mean, that was so important to have that going out to everyone, you know, celebrating the greatness of our food. You know, I, I don't think that, I mean, again, like the visual arts and music, and we did have critics, you know, supporting what was going on, the, the, the newspaper um, was a, a key part to exposing and promoting, you know, the wonderful things that we have in this city. Uh, Justin Nystrom is, is an expert on uh, the history of New Orleans food, and maybe give him a chance to to jump in here with some questions. Yeah, I'm going to pause. Okay. Right. Numbers are changing. Numbers are changing. Great. Um, I'm really interested in, in your comment about all these young faces uh, coming to town, these young baby boomers, late 60s, early 70s, and uh, new faces. And, and um, as a follow-up, uh, where did you go to college? Went to Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, a very traditional Southern gentleman school. And there's a tradition of New Orleans going to Washington. Yes. And yes. A deep tradition. Um, how many of these new faces were people like yourself who went off and went, got educated like Washington and Lee or, or Princeton or right. whatever and came back and, and did amazing things? And how many were these new people? I think there was probably an even split. I think, you know, New Orleans has always attracted people. And, um, you know, when I, when I look back at <clears throat> the, the 70s and the people that, you know, I knew well, um, the artist, uh, again, I think journalism, you know, had a huge impact. I mean, there was a, a real rush of uh, really vibrant, uh, great journalists that have come out of this city a lot of them, you know moved to this city for different reasons and um, I think I think it would probably be an even split between you know the, those who are from here um, But you know a large large number of people who were attracted here, you know for various reasons for the you know the art and culture journalism architecture um, and when I think about it most of the the dynamic people that um, I was engaged with at the CAC and in culture and stuff were actually from out of town who came here and stuff and stayed. That was uh, my next question because, you know, you, you had mentioned you kind of had 1986 as a year where the arts really took right. a downturn right. because of other factors. <laughs> did, you know, how many, how many creative people did we lose to other cities? I don't think a lot. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, some have moved on professionally with their careers. Um, you know, certainly, you know, we look at, you know, in journalism, those who are now with the New York Times or living in Washington and doing, you know, PBS shows and things like that. 
Um, in the arts community, most stayed. You know, they really settled in New Orleans. Um, musicians, I would say, pretty much the same thing. You have the, you know, great artists that come here and stay here. You know, so I, th I think New Orleans is this magnet that doesn't let go of you, you know, and you know, in, in some professions, yes, you, you know, you, you move on professionally um, for bigger things, you know, but um, I think that um, this combination of very talented, creative musicians and artists here that grew up here and then creative people who really want to be here and have found a way to make it work is pretty exceptional. Now, were there, how would you compare what you are all able to create at the Contemporary Arts Center with movements in other towns? Because there were young baby boomers going in other right, regions right. trying to transform what had been really the previous generation style of consuming right. and appreciating art. Um, do you feel New Orleans compares favorably with places like Atlanta and Houston in this regard? Very much so. I mean, particularly in the arts, um, you know, I would say that if, if I looked at the, the arts community here and the arts community in Atlanta or, or Texas, um, number one, it's interesting because the support system for New Orleans artists, you know, when you, when you went into a gallery, most of the art shown was by a New Orleans artist. When you went into a gallery in Houston or Atlanta, it was a New York artist. Now, some of that has changed, again, as these huge numbers of artists are being created and out of art schools and growing up, that Houston has now become a, a, a better supporter of the Texas artists than it was originally. But um, when the CAC first started, I think that, um, you know, we were making New Orleans its own center. I mean, certainly New York with PS1 was our sister organization. They had a lot of New York artists they were supporting, but also New York is an international city. Um, Los Angeles, the same situation. Great California artists that were being supported by these artist spaces. But it kind of brought New Orleans to the same level as other major international American cities. That's great. I mean, when you mentioned PS1, one of my other follow-up questions was, did you partner with anyone uh, We did occasionally. I mean, basically, you know, for a lot of reasons, um, our partners were Houston and Atlanta. You know, geographically, expense, you know, it was easy to, to you know, have shows travel between two different areas and stuff. And um, kind of, you know, that we were sort of a regional a hub of working with those organizations. Occasionally, we would do something with, with PS1. I remember one time, um, the artist Emery Clark, who is best known for her, you know, her, you know, her paintings and her artwork, had created this uh, art cars. And in, you know, she had gotten one of the um, model car companies to donate 500 models, and they were distributed to artists from around the country, and a lot of New Orleans artists created this wonderful environment, so this racetrack with all these artists created cars. And, you know, it was invited to, to be part of one of the openings at PS1. So we all flew up to, to New York in April. It was snowing and we're like, what is this, April snow? And going to PS1, you know, Emory had this incredible installation and Popeyes had just opened up on 42nd Street. So we're, you know, giving away free Popeyes the entire PS1 audience was in that room, enjoying Popeyes and the art. And then the next room was Jeff Koons, who is a major, now internationally known artist, and nobody was in his exhibition. So, you know, between the New Orleans art and the Popeyes, New Orleans fried chicken, you know, we overwhelmed New York at that time and stuff. But it was made mainly interaction between Houston and Atlanta. I never really thought of Popeyes as cultural imperialism. It is, it is. Look at it. I mean, look at those wonderful ads they're doing now. You know, I mean, I love the fact that the French Quarter looks so spectacular. Beautifully you know? shot. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, your, your mention of the baby boomer generation reminded me of a discussion I had with someone about Easy Rider 
mm -hmm. and the importance of Easy Rider in attracting young people right. for good and ill to New Orleans. For good. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, so this person had a mixed, more mixed view. But, but right. tell me your impressions of Easy Rider and what that meant. Well, I mean, you know, I, again, I look back at my timing and stuff and, you know, going off to college, leaving New Orleans in 1968 and leaving the state, and although I was still, you know, in the South, um, being a freshman in college, you know, when Woodstock started. I mean, I did not attend Woodstock. I'm kind of glad I didn't, or maybe wish I had, when I hear friends who actually went and some of the experiences they had. But, you know, part of that whole um, youth revolution, again, it was baby boomers and protesting the Vietnam War, protesting civil rights issues and stuff. And, you know, of course you had the whole drug marijuana culture going on in, in you know, much bigger uh, proportions than we have today. And Easy Rider sort of being this glorification of coming to New Orleans and having the surreal, you know, shots of the, the cemeteries and everything, it kind of helped, you know, again, attract people to New Orleans and everything. And I think that, you know, New Orleans, I remember the warehouse, you know, with all the, the great performances there and the doors and the, the whole music explosion with the warehouse, which was a, a major impact on the music scene here. Um, I think that Easy Rider was one of the first sort of mass media um, exposures of New Orleans to a larger audience that wasn't just the Germans and the Japanese loving Dixieland music and stuff. It was sort of an interesting place to be. And we had our own sort of counterculture movement going on in the French Quarter. I remember Mike Stark with his free clinic and all the different things that were happening in the Quarter at that time, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Again, part of that new generation of people looking for change and being creative. Um, there is sometimes a criticism that I, I, I certainly hear, and I'm sure you've heard, that because New Orleans, particularly uptown, spends so much money on Mardi Gras that it needs to, uh, less money being left over for really great cultural institutions. How do you feel? I mean, that's a question that always sort of is there. Um, it's, it's hard to really say whether, yeah, I mean, the, the Mardi Gras debutante thing of New Orleans is part of our tradition. And, you know, to me, often what's interesting is that, um, you know, when we talk about New Orleans and its diversity and its population, that um, with, we, we still remain a fairly segregated community. And to me, part of that is because historically we've developed a parallel universe. You know, you have, you know, you have Rex and you have Zulu. You have the Illinois Club debutante parties and you have this cotillion and stuff. So, you know, people have evolved survivals in their there are different racial, ethnic groupings in New Orleans, which is pretty unique. To your question, um, you know, yes, I mean, there are things particularly, uh, uh, you know, Mardi Gras is expensive. Um, it does take money to be part of that world. And certainly when, when I hear of, about some of the debutante parties, the, the money that's spent on it, um, that that could potentially take away from that person's donation to the museum or the opera or the symphony. But um, at the same time, um, I'm happy that it exists. You know, I think it's, it, it is as much a part of our culture as a lot of our cultural institutions, or it is a cultural institution in, in its own way. So um, we just have to, I mean, I've always been a person to try to figure out how to make things work with no money coming from New Orleans, it's like you want, you have big ideas, and if we all work on this, we can make things happen, and you know, the rest is history. 
And I think that has, has helped New Orleans develop institutions and organizations that um, survive on a lot less financially, but maybe there's a little bit more passion that goes into these types of activities, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think it does, it does. Um, just have one more, one more question, and you can decline to answer if you, <laughs> if you choose to do so, but you had said that some of the board members of the Contemporary Art Center were not enthusiastic about the crew, crew of parties. Correct. parties. What, can you give us an example of some sort of outrageous behavior that they felt was unbecoming? Well, I mean, there's a, there was a, a wonderful artist um, in New Orleans, um, now I'm having a senior moment, um, who was basically a, a self-sculpture artist. And she would create the human figure. And I remember there was a, a fun exhibit that I had put together and uh, Sandra Blair was her name and she's still an amazing artist. Um, she, was cr she created um, the scene on the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's uh, painting of the creation of man. And so you had all these nude figures with uh, extraordinarily large genitalia in the window at the corner of Camp and Joseph Street with the RTA bus stopping there. And of course, at some point we had the police coming to shut us down because RTA riders were complaining about this obscene art that they could. We had these wonderful, and still have the wonderful windows at the Contemporary Arts, and I always felt that was the best exhibition space. So, you know, Crew of Clones sort of had that kind of mentality. So I remember, you know, Sandra Blair creating these giant figures, you know, nude figures going through the streets of New Orleans that were, you know, uh, offensive to some people. And so that kind of, you know, um, artistic freedom uh, is just one example of all the other crazy kind of ideas that, you know, when, you know, a Mardi Gras parade in the streets, people are drinking, having fun, celebrating, being crazy, costuming, you know, you're going to cross the line of what, you know, people would expect to see in Oklahoma. And so, you know, that was just one example of, you know, the shock of your more established uh, philanthropist, you know, uptown, conservative, wherever. They don't necessarily have to live uptown. Um, there are a lot of wonderful people who live uptown. Um, but, you know, there, there was just, as, as the CAC was desperately looking for financial support from the traditional funding base of New Orleans, um, that often was sort of being used as the excuse as why we weren't getting that funding. I don't believe it. Uh, I know a lot of very fun, creative, you know, philanthropic people who live in this city who, you know, enjoy that. And now you'd be surprised at who's out there doing those types of things. But I think for a couple conservative members, that was sort of the, you know, the horror of us doing this type of lewd behavior in the streets of New Orleans. It's like it's Mardi Gras. Definitely uh, another take on the word exhibition. Right. Ist. <laughs> um, those are the follow-ups that I have. Can I ask, without, let me just hover over the microphone here. One thing that uh, we didn't talk about when we were from is this architecture. Right. We had, in, in terms of how it how got expressed in the majority of cases where all the money was spent. We had all, all these talented architects coming working for the big firms, mm -hmm. but mostly doing small projects. Right. And, and the expression of corporate architecture in New Orleans, uh, for the most part, are late international style, 1970s, early 1980s, flat top boxes right. on Poitry Street. Um, why didn't we do better than that in terms of Design distinction. We sort of okay, right. You know, on a street that has a fairly distinctive building in the form of a superdome at one end. 
right. I mean, we're, we're, we're so fortunate to have the Superdome, which is like this amazing structure that, you know, I think form created what it ultimately looked like. Um, and, you know, we do have some good examples of, of modern architecture, whether it's the original Pan Am building, the Skidmore Owens and Merrill building on Canal Street, or some of the, the Curtis and Davis brilliant buildings. I mean, the international trademark. Right. Right. And, you know, but I think... But those are 1960s buildings. 1960s. Um, I think architecture in New Orleans is negatively impacted by the money that's here. Um, when I look at the uh, international trademark as it exists now, and I'm a proponent of keeping it, and I think there could be some interesting things done to it, you know, on the un envelope. I remember as a kid seeing the brochure of the original design that Edward Durrell Stone had done, which was this marble tower and, you know, with its Islamic influences and everything, very much like the Huntington Hartford, and realizing then just as, I guess, with the Pan American building on Porter Street, I think that whole complex originally they brought in Philip Johnson to do. Um, with architecture, you're talking about a great deal of money, you know, to, to, to reach the, the design elements that a great architect wants. And New Orleans has always been a cheap town, you know, and economically, I think that that has, I, I can't imagine the discussions that Stone must have had with the international trademark people about, well, you know, that's going to cost X millions and we, we only have half of that. And so you have to come down to these materials and they try to do it. So I think, I think money has negatively impacted the, the architecture in this town. Um, we're lucky that New Orleans had this rich history pre-Civil War and even after Civil War into the 1880s and these wonderful styles that we, we helped develop. But you're not going to find uh, a lot of great architecture here because we don't have the money to really, you know, support those ideas. So even the, the, the vibrancy of um, the art movement of the 1970s couldn't reach into the, the corporate decision making that would have affected the corporate right. powers for the oil companies and the bridge. Right. I mean, we, we were lucky that they were purchasing art for the building and stuff. Um, but I don't think that, um, I mean, New Orleans is, is not, you know, headquarters of, of very many big businesses. And certainly the ones that we had, you know, in the 70s and early 80s have moved on. I mean, we're, we're actually fortunate on Poydras Street by the Superdome to have had, you know, at one time, Freeport MacMoran and those buildings. And some of those are fairly interesting. But I just don't think that, um, you know, when, when you see the the great contemporary architecture around the world you're talking about places that are thriving economically whether in you know china or the middle east or or you know south korea or wherever um you know one of the the things that you know i always think about new orleans architecture is that we were fortunate you know after the civil war to be too poor of a city to tear down what we had. I mean, you look at other cities where, you know, yes, we did tear down Treme and, and some, some big mistakes, but, you know, buildings were really left to sort of rot. I mean, I can remember in the French Quarter back in, you know, the, the late 50s and early 60s, I mean, those buildings were still in, in terrible shape. But, and that's a case where regulations prevented, you know, demolition. But um, uptown New Orleans, you know, we didn't have the wealth that was going to say, well, let's tear down that old building and build some, you know, new fabulous structure. I think we've, we've, been, we've been fortunate to recycle, you know, what we have because I think we're somewhat strapped financially. I was, when I think about architecture in New Orleans in the 1970s, we, we rediscovered those things to, to recycle. Mm -hmm. same time as the other part of the architecture equation was the new buildings. Mm -hmm. And even though we were a prosperous 
Kansas City, or at least what it seemed to be uh, for a few years in the 1970s. We didn't seem to get distinction in the new architecture that right. we really have now. Basically, just re asking the question you just answered. I think we were sort of a junior city. I mean, Houston and Atlanta. I mean, again, watching with my parents, I mean, I remember with their company out of New York going to Houston and where they opened up a branch of their business out of New Orleans and going, what is this? I mean, Houston looked like Kenner, you know, when we were growing up. There was nothing there. And when going to Atlanta as they opened up their branch operation in Atlanta, Atlanta wasn't anything like it is today and everything. And those two cities, you know, for different reasons economically have just skyrocketed, you know, and you can see that in the architecture, you know, the, the, the money that's put into those incredible buildings where we were always, even when we were doing a little bit of thriving, you know, and I mean, one shell square is a nice building and it's a, I guess a clone of the one in Houston and everything. But generally, we were a, a semi-bustling community on a budget, you know, and you just didn't have that kind of, oh, let's throw a lot more money into making this even spectacular. And there hasn't been, you know, maybe because we do appreciate our historic structures, there isn't that kind of interest that you see in other cities in, you know, new design. Um, I think that's probably a challenge for a lot of people. And, you know, even watching, you know, with Make It Right sort of, you know, and, and I'm glad they, they were thinking in these terms of how do we do a contemporary adaptation of a traditional New Orleans thing. It wasn't just like, let's do the most contemporary thing possible. You know, we, we may be weighed down a little bit in our love and appreciation of, of historic architecture. John, is there anything we uh, didn't give you a chance to say? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you uh, sure. so much for, for this amount. This has been fun. And, and the thoughtfulness, and uh, I've learned some stuff. Great. Appreciate it. Great. I enjoyed it too. Thank you.